Um, it's 12.04. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, as everybody knows, I'm Ray Chavez, the president of the Manufacturers Association. I'm very happy to have all of you here. Uh, we probably will have more people popping in here as, uh, as we go along, but it is a great pleasure to be able to have this virtual trade show and conference uh, in the Verbella platform. It is different for all of us. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit of fun, and uh, I encourage you to uh, uh, experiment with it, take a look at it. But for today, uh, for our little uh, presentation that we have today, we've got two, uh, two great speakers. I want to do give uh, um, uh, a shout out to Burke and Prusky. They are our conference sponsor. Uh, they are a metal fab and power coating company, and we're very glad that they were uh, our sponsor for our conference. Rosie, next slide. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce two keynote speakers that are, are very active in our region and in our San Antonio community. And uh, our first one is Kevin Vocal. He is the president uh, of Toyota Motor Manufacturing Texas, or TMMTX. It's based here in San Antonio, and they produce both the Tundra full size and Tacoma size mid size um, pickup trucks. He plays an active role in the community by serving on the board of directors for the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Uh, some positions that he's had, he's served as the senior vice president of Toyota in 2018. Um, I should say TMMTX in 2018. And he's also held positions as the vice president of One Toyota Competitiveness and the group manager of production strategy for Toyota Motor North America. Uh, during his tenure at, um, with Toyota, he has established two new business partnering groups, the Toyota Organization for the Development of Latinos and also the Toyota Veterans Association. He is from Texas, a little small town in Rockdale, and uh, he is very proud of his Texas heritage and uh, being a fellow Texan, very proud of you too, Kevin, for, for doing this. He enjoys many outdoor activities and spending time with family. Our other speaker is Jenna Salcedo uh, Herrera. She's the president and chief executive officer for the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. Uh, in this capacity, she works with a talented team to advance the diversification and growth of the San Antonio regional economy through domestic and international business development, workforce development, and partnerships and marketing strategies. Uh, she uh, has received accolades, including the 2015 Women in the Leadership Award and the 2017 40 Under 40 Women, Woman of the Year uh, from the San Antonio Business Journal. She also serves on several community boards and councils throughout the community, and she's a great partner for the San Antonio Manufacturers Association. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. Kevin. Thank you, Ray. You walk up here to the stage. Let me walk back. Well, thank you, everyone, and good afternoon to everyone attending. It's my pleasure to be here with you, all the SAMBA members, customers, clients, and future business partners in this unique virtual setting, as Ray mentioned. Hey, today, I'll share a little bit about Toyota, specifically about Toyota Motor Manufacturing Texas, which we call Team MTX, where we do assemble Toyota's trucks right here in the south side of San Antonio. Additionally, as Ray mentioned, uh, we're fit, fortunate to have Jenna, and she's going to be able to share a little more of the regional outlook for manufacturing here uh, from her position. To make sure we have enough time to uh, get to Jenna's remarks and your questions, I'm going to dive right in. So first, let's talk about the elephant in the room, COVID-19. Maybe some of you are tired of talking about that, but it's really the reason we're having a virtual trade show this year and probably the number one item on everyone's list of issues that we've dealt with since 2020. You know, for me, it almost feels like we started dealing with the pandemic a decade ago instead of just a year. And I distinctly remember worrying about how would we, as the president of Toyota, uh, worrying about how do we keep our team members safe and what this would mean for the auto industry as a whole. You know, as the world went into lockdown, we thought if people are at home, they're certainly not going to be driving as much. And if jobs are in danger, people won't want the expense of a car payment. So. Basically, I thought grocery stores and Zoom may be the only company spared from the economic impact, but the rest of us were in the dark about the impact we may face. So here at Toyota, we shut down all of our North American plants, uh, which we have 14, uh, in starting in 2020 of March. 
Of course, at the time, we thought we'd be home for only a couple of days, maybe sanitize and get back to work as usual, uh, not knowing much about the virus at that time. And of course, I was dead wrong. Seven weeks later, we finally reopened. And like many of you, what we came back to was a very different environment than when we left. Toyota spent those seven weeks of downtime studying the guidance coming out of CDC. We consulted with medical experts and putting our Kaizen mindset to work to completely remake what manufacturing looks like today. You know, we had about 400 executives across North America developing a, what we call the playbook of safe at work, um, which covered everything from one way walkways to when we wear face shields. You know, these protocols allowed us to safely return to work, and most of them, for the majority, are still in place today, with some changes along the way to address new CDC guidelines and efficiencies. Of course, we are Toyota after all. You know, during our downtime in the early stages, we wanted to also help the community, and we were fortunate to have the resources to use our skills to build COVID PPE. We made face shields in-house and donated over 75,000 of them to the state and local first responders and medical personnel. But through it all, we maintain a high level of communication with not just our team members, but also our peers in the business community. I was asked by Mayor Nuremberg and Judge Wolf to co-chair the economic transition team, which worked to create playbooks similar to Toyota's Safe Work Playbook for 11 industries in our own region that you see the greater Safer Together, which was also sponsored by Jenna and her team. I would have to say this region successfully implemented a safe, responsible return to work that balanced our needs to provide both jobs with the safety of people performing those jobs. But then in an unexpected twist, when we came back to production, Toyota found itself with the demand for vehicles that was something beyond what we ever imagined. Now, we're not only seeing a different, decent amount of man, we found ourselves behind the supply curve since we hadn't been stocking our dealers lots for seven weeks. Our insight was that people were looking for new vehicles as a way to practice social distancing instead of relying on ride shares or public transportation. We also heard that trades were relatively unharmed. Construction, for example, still needs vehicles, especially trucks, as the demand has been higher than ever. In fact, since COVID began, We've had several instances of best ever sales for certain months. And in terms of stability, this was a best case scenario for us as an automotive manufacturer. After a few months back in production, we reached a point where we understood how to successfully work with new safety processes in place and working as much as we feasibly could to meet high demand. But of course, COVID wasn't quite done with us yet. Late in 2020, we began to realize an unintended consequence of pandemic life. As people were working from home and generally staying indoors, the demand for personal electronics like laptops and gaming systems have skyrocketed. And microchips that drive those personal electronics has also drive our vehicles, no pun intended. These chips are also found in household appliances like washing machines, refrigerators, and many other appliances. And maybe some of you are experiencing some of the same supply demand shortages for these appliances. But many companies rely on these microchips as a general terminology. You know, the entire auto industry, along with other industries, are certainly in, certainly in a supply chain shortage that threatened to derail our recovery after COVID shut it down. To complicate matters, the process for producing microchips like these takes months of lead time, and there's no way to start a new batch instantly to relieve the supply constraint. Additionally, we're not a priority for chip makers for a number of reasons. First, the majority of the world's automakers had stopped producing for a number of weeks or months, so demand dropped suddenly, which then caused supply to shrink. Secondly, what in, if the industry does purchase in a smaller compared to other industries, so we're not the top of the food chain. In other words, we don't have a lot of leverage to fix this brewing problem. And by we, I mean the entire global auto industry. This isn't unique to one vehicle make or the other. It hit us all. I want to pause here just for a moment to make sure I'm emphasizing this point. We're not seeing a minor supply chain interruption. This is a global shift in consumer electronics demand, and it's gonna be part of what I talk about the rest of the day. 
It's driven by the pandemic, which is a factor a little bit outside of our control. I'm highlighting this because as manufacturing and business people, you need to realize that shifts like this are possible and we need to be prepared how to handle them. I'm gonna discuss this more in a minute, but let's first get back to the auto industry's global part shortage. As we were weathering the microchip shortage storm, we were literally hit with another one. The historic winter freeze that took Texas out of commission for a week in February also caused another big impact. Not only did it negatively impact homes and the people in our state, but it also caused another part shortage for the global auto industry. You see the petrochemical producers in Houston along the coast were forced to close for weeks at a time, creating a chemical supply shortage affecting several auto components that further compounded our supply chain industry. Not necessarily chips, but things like foam for seats and those type of things. But that's not all. The freeze also indirectly furthered the microchip shortage. Let me explain. When Toyota first had the microchip shortage, we identified backup suppliers right up the road in Austin that we tapped to help fill our orders. But needless to say, after a week of freezing weather, we were back to square one in their timeline to produce no chips as they were shut down also. And there's still more. A chip maker in Japan, which you rely on, then suffered a fire, sending them back months. At this point, we're talking about both the demand shift caused by COVID and a supply chain interruption caused by weather and fire. It's a perfect storm. So microchips around the world are in short supply. The chemicals needed for parts are in short supply. The only thing is not in short supply is the number of people who wants to buy a new car or truck and demand is still thriving, but maybe you've seen that. So where does this leave us? Oddly enough, it puts Toyota in familiar territory. You know, we've been man manufacturing in the U.S. for over 35 years, and we've weathered quite a few crises in that time. In just the Toyota history of Texas, this includes the Great Recession in 2008, where we stopped producing for three months. From there, we faced the impact of the Great Japan earthquake and tsunami that affected the global supply chain in 2011. While we weren't happy to be back on uncertain ground, we did have an idea of what to do. Of course, we took the immediate step of reducing overtime to help conserve parts. While this wouldn't help us meet customer demand, it did provide the long-term employment stability for our employees that's important to us as responsible employers. On a regional scale, one of the first things Toyota did was implement an allocation plan. While our purchasing team was working daily to source the parts we needed, we also took a holistic approach to ensure our North America plants shared the burden. In line with the customer demand we were seeing, if you've been following the chip shortage in the news, you might have come across a few articles that talk about how Toyota has come out of this relatively unscathed. To be clear, we're absolutely feeling the impact, but maybe not as severe as what our fellow automakers are experiencing, and that's just because we've learned from our history. After the supply shortages from the Great Japan Earthquake, we altered our purchasing strategy. We're still just in time manufacturing operation, but with smaller parts, we have to be able to create small stockpiles that can help us outlast some turbulent times. We also encouraged our suppliers to do the same. In fact, at Toyota, we took the unprecedented step of outlining our entire supply chain. This is means identifying almost 400,000 items, in some cases, 10 layers supplier deep. At the time in 2000 level, it was in 2011, it was unheard of in the auto industry to do this and gather this type of deep information. We also committed to increasing our supply chain options and ensuring that there was a regional diversity in where suppliers located around the world. But now in 2021, we find ourselves grateful for those changes, even though it's the first true test with this purchasing shift. While the petrochemical shortage was short-lived, the microchip issue is ongoing. With the long-term changes we made years ago and the short-term changes we implemented for the specific issue, we do see the light at the end of the tunnel. In fact, the entire auto industry should now begin to recover throughout this year and next. 
and government talks are already taking place at the national level to ensure that the U.S. economy is protected from future microchip issues. So what does this mean for your business? Maybe you're not in automotive or not in any other industries impacted by these shortages, but I am hopeful that this discussion provide a profound lesson for you. Yes, we were hit by a supply chain interruption caused by weather and fire. This interruption will be resolved in short term and midterm as businesses become returned to normal levels. But the real lesson to be learned is from the shift in consumer demand. And after more of a year of pandemic living, it's safe to say that there will not be a return to normal as we once knew. This isn't a blip that we can outlast. This is real demand change, most likely with permanent change. And we'll need a resolution to, to the mid to long-term supply chain. It's up to us to shift our business models to adapt now to this reality. Learn from this historic period in the market. Where does your supply chain come from and are you diversified? Those are the real questions. And who else is using your same materials? If there's a sudden increase in demand from someone else, how will that impact you? And if it does, can you pivot quickly? To new suppliers, to new output levels that don't hurt your bottom line. Can you diversify your regional supply base? And what other steps can you take to insulate your business from factors that are out of your control? These are the things that I think are the takeaways from how we take negative issues and negative impacts and learn from them to get stronger. Take the time to learn from the troubles others are facing now so you're prepared to face change in the future. Based on my example of how Toyota implemented new purchasing practices, even though we don't need them for a decade, I think it's clear that how you learn from your history plays a crucial role in the future success you face and change. Take the two photos, for example. The left image is from the papal address before the invention of the iPhone. The right photo is taken from the same spot of a papal address after the iPhone was introduced. I think the picture speaks a thousand words, but this is what consumer change looks like. With one product, consumers change their behavior. To bring this to current times, in 2019, no one knew that 2020 would bring a COVID pandemic, and we learned to cope. Now in 2021, in a hopeful post-pandemic world, we need to learn as businesses how to thrive. The lesson can be attributed to Charles Darwin, as he said, it is not the strongest that survives, but the most adaptable to change. For Toyota, our adaptability continues to be with our transition to a mobility company. This includes understanding the automotive market shift to electrified vehicles. You know, at Toyota, we believe the goal of reducing carbon in the atmosphere is a priority shared by all. Over the past 20 years, Toyota has led the way with more electrified vehicles on the road than all other automakers combined. And we'll continue to lead with a portfolio of hybrids plug-ins, battery electrics, and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles that our customers want to buy. Working together with government and the industry, we'll accelerate our efforts toward a net zero carbon future. And we'll take our commitment to environmental stewardship seriously, in part because it's the right thing to do for ourselves and our children, but also because this is the path of our customers. By 2025, we've committed to having electrified option for every model in our lineup, and that's just right around the corner. As we expand our vehicle options and the infrastructure expands to support more electrified vehicles, we expect to remain leaders in this space because of our commitment to reaching carbon neutrality and our innovation as a company. This innovation has already led to incredible advancements in automotive technology just in the last few years alone. The advances fall under the distinct areas we refer to as CASE, which stands for Connected Cars, Autonomous Driving, Shared Technology, and Electrified Vehicles. These all serve to advance our mission as a mobility company and highlight our innovation. Under Electrified Innovation, this month alone, we announced that we're introducing a hydrogen engine 
that's part of our Japanese racing lineup. And earlier this year, we de debuted a new line of battery electric vehicles under the BZ mark, which stands for Beyond Zero. That's a phrase we use in our plan to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and move beyond zero in environmental impact and start having a net positive environmental benefit. These are just a few of our global plans that represent a tremendous amount of forward momentum. Locally, we're also moving forward with the $391 million investment project that we announced in late 2019. As the pandemic emerged, it challenged us to adapt locally to keep our project on track. By incorporating virtual elements, we not only adapted, but became more efficient by maximizing participation that simply wasn't possible when we were solely in person. In early 2020, before the pandemic hit, we also announced plans to introduce the Sequoia SUV to our plant, a, a, something we're very proud of. This will make us a Toyota's full-size body-on-frame plant and the only plant in the world building the Tundra and the Sequoia. With the pandemic, we also shifted how we interact with our community. Obviously, we aren't hosting plant tours that used to allow us to see over 20,000 people a year, but instead we have virtual tour program in place focused on providing STEM educations to students. To ensure we support the community gaps, we recognize the digital disadvantage with our area and supported to improve digital access through a $500,000 donation to six school districts that are working on the wrong side of the digital divide. Why is there focus here? Well, just like our commitment to reach carbon neutrality and go beyond zero, accessing and addressing the digital divide serves two purposes. First, because it's the right thing to do. Two, children have the right to an education, no matter where they live, no matter how much money they make. But we're also looking to digital divide and STEM education because these children are the workforce of our future. If we wanna to continue to build San Antonio for the next 20 to 50 years, we need to set those students up for success now. We need them to have access to school and we need them to embrace STEM and advanced manufacturing. Just like Toyota equipped ourselves to weather the supply chain storm over a decade ago, Toyota is starting to address the issues of the future now. And with the growth of manufacturing footprint in San Antonio region, that means we're all competing for the same talent unless we're, unless we're all strategically working to create more of those resources, more employees. With that same solutions oriented thinking, Toyota Texas started FAME with our partners like Bear County to develop skilled technicians to repair and maintain our robots. There aren't enough to go around unless we develop more. The pace of change that we've seen in manufacturing historically is only gonna increase. Technology advancing at a rate that could leave us behind if we're not already starting to prepare for the future now. And to the pace the world is opening up and the pace our region is expanding, if you haven't started to ramp up yet, you're already behind. So today I've asked a lot of questions meant to trigger how you think about being prepared for your future. And my next question is no different. What are you doing to make sure you'll have the workforce of the future? Are you involved with the summer internship programs like the one run by SA Works? Do you participate in Texas fame? If the answer is no, you need to ask yourself why not? Offering jobs is just not enough. If you aren't contributing to our region's workforce needs, you really aren't prepared for what's to come. When you think about all the announcement we've seen in just the last few years of ICE and Navistar, Tesla, just to name a few, they're also bringing jobs here and they're fighting for the same pool of employees that you are. And I'll tell them, as I'm telling you now, your chance to secure your success in the future starts now. And with the growth we see on the horizon for San Antonio, your future is bright. And we're primed for continued success on all fronts. This is an area of a growing business hub, especially in manufacturing. And I think it's the perfect time to transition to Jenna. As the president and CEO of the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation, that she joined in 2016, 
I think she has the perfect view and is responsible for advancing the diversification and growth of San Antonio regional economy through her domestic and international business attributes, partnerships, and, and marketing strategies. Not only were Jenna and her team instrumental in working with us at Toyota to bring our recent investment, but she was also instrumental to bring some of our key suppliers and other manufacturing to the area. SAEDF is a great friend to Toyota, consistently supporting us as we have been growing our footprint in San Antonio. And they've made it easy to form a long-term partnership from our growth and stability in the region. And they provide the service for every member in their organization. With that, please let, help me welcome Jenna to the stage to talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Let me see if I can make my way up here. Great round of applause. This is very interactive. Let's see here. All right. I'm actually not a big uh, podium person in real life. So if I don't make my way up to it effectively and I'm standing to the side of it, this is much more realistic. Thank you, Louisa, uh, for encouraging me here as I made my way up. Um, and, and thank you to Ray and the SAMA team for the invitation to participate uh, this afternoon. It's always great to, to be with the SAMA group. Um, we partner so closely with the SAMA organization on both our business attraction and primarily our business retention and expansion program. So happy to be here. I also always love hearing uh, Kevin's perspective and uh, how detailed he can get uh, into the subject matter that he's presenting on. So it's always fascinating for me to, to hear updates. And I'm sure like all of you, I was taking uh, copious notes and, and there were lots of follow-ups uh, from his conversation. Um, I'm gonna ask if we can uh, head into my first slide um, thank you. So at the Economic Development Foundation, um, we have just recalibrated on our comprehensive strategic approach to uh, executing on our mission. Uh, and very simply, our mission is about creating jobs. So creating jobs, retaining jobs, that's the gist of our mission at the Economic Development Foundation. And as we were going through the process to recalibrate our strategic direction, we really simplified, uh, in fact, oversimplified, I believe, uh, our approach uh, to, again, executing on the mission of creating jobs in the San Antonio region. And where we landed was that we knew if we wanted to continue to be successful at securing jobs in San Antonio, and if we wanted to be more successful uh, in doing so, that we needed to invest in our people, and in our place. And that's basically what Kevin teed up. You know, we, we've got to engage uh, not only from the near term opportunities to employ San Antonians, but also the long term talent pipeline development. Um, next slide, please. So this slide, and, and by the way, I can't see them, so um, I'm trusting that Melissa is on my workforce development equals economic development slide here. And I'm not going to play with the, with the system because I know I'll screw something up, so I'm just going to keep talking. Um, but uh, again, going to the, to the concept of investing in people and doing so effectively, uh, we've come to the realization, uh, and not just we at the EDF, I'll kind of pull in our regional partners and really any economic development organization across the country, We've come to the realization that workforce development is truly economic development. Down below, you see a table uh, specifically that ranks the decision-making elements for corporate executives across the country. And so this was um, an area development magazine survey that was conducted. And you see back in 2006, the top 10 rankings for site selection location decisions. Uh, labor cost was of course at the top, you know, some infrastructure access by highways, uh, rail, et cetera, corporate tax rate uh, was important and is still important. But look over to the right, and this is 2018. I would, I would argue that today, you know, on the heels of a global pandemic, it's even more important. But availability of skilled labor is number one. And then of course, labor cost is still very important. And, and the CEOs in the room, and I know there are several, can, can speak to this better than I can. Um, but what I thought was interesting was that 
quality of life showed up for the first time in 2018, right? That goes back to the place element of, of what I just previously outlined in our strategic framework. Um, and then of course, skilled labor rose to the top. Next slide. Now, again, this is another slide that I think Ray and, and you all in the audience could probably outline even better than I can. Um, but what I wanted to talk about specifically here, uh, one, that we're extremely proud of our manufacturing industry within the region. But I also wanted to hit on something that uh, Kevin outlined. He talked about the growth of the industry, specifically as he was outlining the need to invest in, in workforce development. And, and he is absolutely right as it relates to vehicle manufacturing, uh, the growth of Toyota. Uh, and their suppliers here with Aishin AW and so many more um, that have located in the region. And Navistar, of course, located uh, their manufacturing facility here. And we know that there's a multiplier effect here and that we'll be locating um, additional suppliers to support that plant. Um, and then, of course, Tesla right up the road, right? Um, so think in terms of the mega region, because we all know that the workforce is going to be coming from anywhere south of San Antonio to or, uh, north of Austin for all of these different facilities. Um, so as we think about workforce development and we think about partnerships around the region, it's, it's extremely important to keep in mind the future growth specifically as it relates to that section or that sector of our manufacturing industry. Next slide. This is probably my uh, favorite slide of the entire presentation um, because it's an opportunity to highlight our regional strength. Um, in the past, um, the San Antonio MSA uh, hasn't always partnered as formally as we are now um, with regards to our economic development pursuits. And now we've uh, entered into formal partnerships with the folks that you see here on the slide. And of course, there are uh, many more that are coming to the table and partnering with us for co-marketing, um, but also a little bit of, of deal sharing downstream. Uh, we've done that informally uh, in the past. And of course, our economic development partners in the region are extremely aggressive and, and have so many different tools um, to bring to the table when we're attempting to work deals. But going forward, you're going to see us work together even more uh, formally and collaboratively. And this is, certainly isn't a novel idea. If you look at EDOs across the country, the majority of them are structured as regional economic development entities. Um, just look within the state of Texas, right? Austin is a regional collaborative. The Dallas Regional Chamber is a regional collaborative, a Greater Houston Partnership, et cetera. Um, but here specifically, I mean, thinking in terms of the broader story and the opportunity for us to share about the region, significant population growth, uh, growth in educational attainment and two year and four year certifications aligned to our target industries is extremely impressive. Next slide. I won't spend too much time here, but I did want to talk a little bit about what's different in this new strategic approach, um, the all in strategy. So you see under the jobs, people place pillars, we have these 10 different initiatives um, that we have flushed out. And of course, very detailed tactical and operation plans beneath each one. Um, but the highlights here are specifically under jobs. In addition to operating more regionally, we're also going to be focusing on the DOD. Uh, military retention of commands and recruitment of commands and talk a little bit more about that. But we've got a lot of opportunity that exists uh, there. And we specifically think that there's a greater opportunity to streamline and centralize our approach to engaging with the DOD. On the people front, um, and this again is the highlight of, of all of our presentation today, um, but in addition to focusing on better collaboration uh, regarding talent development programs aligned specifically to our target industries of focus and manufacturing primarily, we're also going to be leaning, leaning into talent retention and talent recruitment as well. And then under the place category, uh, we're going to be investing significant dollars into marketing the region, both globally and domestically. But I wanted to highlight uh, specifically our support of the airport, because that is a regional tool that all of our different economic development allies depend on. And so you see here that we're going to work in partnership with the airport on the look and feel and the, the branding of the airport, because it is the first and last destination within the region that most individuals see and experience. 
um, but we're also going to be contemplating uh, potential airline marketing incentives uh, for nonstop service. And again, a lot of economic development organizations across the country do this, um, but this is new um, to what we will do within our regional collaborative. Next slide. This slide just goes into a little bit more detail about our corporate recruitment target sectors. Um, but I just wanted to flesh out the view here, not to overly complicate it, but obviously there's a private sector element um, to attraction, an R&D element, and then of course, as I mentioned, the military and DOD. In fact, I would argue that our DOD assets are what allow us to compete uh, specifically across industries, but specifically for cybersecurity um, and for bioscience opportunities. And as you all know, they're uh, long gone are the days where we can talk about cybersecurity as an industry uh, because it, it really it touches every single thing that we do. And I'm very pleased at, at what um, UTSA and the Port of San Antonio and other uh, organizations are doing around Saimani. I think that's going to differentiate us as a region as well. Next slide. Some inside baseball for you here, just to show some some progress. And again, this is just you know specific to um, San Antonio stats. And I know that our our partners up in Seguin and Shirts and New Braunfels have a whole lot uh, working as well within their pipeline. Um, but just to showcase here, you know, just in Q1 of this year, uh, we've actually this number on headquarters is up to three because we just closed on one uh, yesterday as well. Um, but some headquarter activity, cyber activity, and primarily manufacturing activity. Again, going back to what Kevin mentioned, I mean, we know that we're competitive here, we know we're growing, and so we truly need to get serious about building up the talent development uh, pipeline for all of these different uh, current employers and future or prospective employers into the market. Um, I wanted to show over to the right the breakdown. This is actually our pipeline. Uh, so projects in the pipeline that have yet to be announced, and you see this is by jobs, right? So manufacturing, uh, it's typically the, the larger projects, so higher job counts, um, but some good activity there on the headquarters and bioscience and tech side of the equation as well. Last slide. And then I, I just wanted to close here with talking about the economic impact that true regional collaboratives can generate. Um, over the next five years, as we execute um, this new strategy, we're hopeful that uh, we can deliver 140,000 new jobs to the region and over $55 billion of economic impact. And of course, that translates directly into the manufacturing industry and, and all of the shared service industries uh, around the region. So we're really excited about the opportunity to move forward and, and begin to implement this plan. And as I mentioned, we have incredible partners around the region that are doing creative things, not just on what we would call traditional economic development, corporate recruitment, retention and expansion, but specifically on the workforce development side. So as Kevin uh, encouraged you to do, I will echo, uh, please do engage in internships. I think we shared some information in the chat. Um, go to the job fairs. I think Seguin is actually hosting a job fair today. I mean, we, we and our partners are trying to do as much as we can to connect the demand side, the employers to, to the supply side that is the talent. Uh, and so the more that you engage, the better um, that we will all be together as a region. Uh, thank you for your time. And with that, I will attempt to turn back around and sit back down in my chair, Ray. Over to you. I've got to turn on my mic. Kevin and uh, Jenna, thank you so much for the presentation um, that you provided. Right now is the time for uh, Q&A. So at this time, I will ask Michelle and my staff if you see anything in the chat box for a question or for anybody in the audience, you can raise your hand to ask a question if you'd like. Your raise your hand feature is to the right of your chat feature. So if you would like to. But, Whoops, what am I doing here? Nope, nope, I don't want to walk away. Hi, Ray. <laughs> I meant that there was a bo there was a message in my box. <laughs> okay, I'm coming back up. So <clears throat> 
Kevin, a question for you that I have is, is basically with Toyota doing all, all that it's done, it's been her, uh, a Herculean effort for you all and what's been happening this past, um, um, past year with the COVID pandemic. Small and medium-sized businesses are also affected as well. And some of the big issues that they're facing is workforce, um, production, cost of resources, uh, finding workers um, and really not having the the finances to really compete with the larger organizations. Uh, you had mentioned that <clears throat> we need to start growing our own in our training pipeline. Um, would you would you say that maybe doing internships uh, internally with their with their employees right now be a a, a good thing to do for them? Hey, Bray, this is Kevin. So thanks for the question. You know, for all of our uh, businesses and, and collectively SEMA uh, members and, you know, and, and like, I would encourage you to look at the resources that are out there. Uh, if you're not involved, Jenna can speak to this all through, through, through SA Works, but there's a tremendous amount of, of partnerships and efforts within the city that in economic development that offer these types of things to, that for a business to participate and, you know, internships are one of those ways that we also do. We do, too. We do an internship for high school students through the summer. Uh, and then we have a more purposeful one through FAME that uh, is a two-year program to develop into full-time employees. But the first internship that we have with the summer is a great way to first introduce uh, students to a potential job career with your company and get them introduced. What we do is we take that seven week period and we rotate them through different areas. So they have a fundamental understanding of our business. We get to meet them. And then it's almost like a little bit of a marketing and a test that they can see what they want to do. And then we encourage them. But working through SA Works, uh, I think, is a good way to start the connection if you're not familiar. And, and I'll ask Jenna if she wants to expand on that. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that opportunity. Um, and, and I agree with you 100 percent, you know, engagement, first and foremost, and awareness is important because, unfortunately, a lot of our youth and, and perhaps even dislocated workers don't understand the opportunity that exists within our target sector, specifically manufacturing. Uh, you can earn, a, you know, a great salary, have access to benefits, and, and a lot of these folks don't realize that. So internships build that awareness. Um, I would argue that Job Shadow and other work-based learning programs do that same thing. And uh, SA Works is a, a perfect opportunity to, to get connected and engage. And, and But we partner with so many different folks from around the community, Alamo Colleges, Texas Fame, the county's program that Toyota helped uh, to incubate here. So there's so much good work happening. Um, if I can be candid and perhaps a little bit negative here, um, I also know that there are real challenges right now. And we have manufacturers bleeding today because they, they can't hire um, staff. And, and when you look at the unemployment, that's coming out perhaps until September ish and the potential to even stack those benefits with our train for jobs SA and SA ready to work programs. Unfortunately, a lot of San Antonians aren't incentivized to go back to work. So I think what's happening right now is a little bit of a wage reckoning. I mean, we're going to have to, to calibrate and figure that out. But I do believe that what's happening with SA Ready to Work and the tax reallocation um, to support long-term training stipends is a good move. It's going to help us in the long term to build up the pipeline that we need for these uh, in-demand occupation. But the challenge is really real right now, not just for manufacturing, but also uh, our hospitality sector. So I, I just want to be candid that we know that, that people are hurting and, and we've even we've contemplated and I believe that we're going to execute to job fairs even with high school students right now beyond just our targeted advertisements. I mean, we really want to try to make those connections because um, it's just tough to come by talent right now. Hey, Ray, That's there, great. Ray, there we is a public, a public this comment. Yes. So do you want to go ahead and read that, uh, Kevin, or would you like me to do it? Uh, yeah, thanks. I didn't know if it was available just to me or I, I didn't know how that worked, but if it's nope. on there, it says, how are you working with UTSA and other universities with the big push for experiential learning opportunities? 
so let me address first, and then again, if Jen wants to expand, she may have some other programs. But I think it, to address the question, Toyota, uh, I spoke to about high school students and fame, uh, but on the same lens, uh, we also do have a co-op program. We call it a co-op program where we have students come from college in between, uh, they can come up to three years uh, at different times in the summer or throughout the, the semesters where they come and take a semester to work with us. And we partner with them uh, with different uh, mentors in our facility to have them gain real world experience and the potential job opportunities with us. But we also have a host that we work from K4 all the way through universities where we have different programs of through either our philanthropic give or through working directly with the university on specific programs for working scholarships. So Toyota has many ways that maybe uh, to expand on that we can connect, but we definitely do work with UTSA. Yeah, and just chiming in there, um, you know, this evolution um, to the realization that workforce development equals economic development means that uh, folks like Taylor, Amy, and uh, Cynthia Matson are serving on our uh, executive committee at the Economic Development Foundation. So they certainly understand that that alignment needs to exist strategically. Uh, operationally and tactically, the alignment also exists. So um, across the board through the Promise programs, of course, ACD rolled out the Alamo Promise program that subsidizes um, two-year certifications within in-demand occupations. And of course, UTSA has their bold promise and a and now has an equivalent. Um, but I think Kevin hit on something extremely important because we all, I think, agree that experiential learning is the difference, right? That awareness, that access, the opportunity to, to truly experience what a career pathway can look like um, is certainly important. Um, but I also think that that continued alignment and the long-term trajectory with those opportunities and alignment with both the public and private sectors is what will differentiate San Antonio. So making progress in that regard, um, but I think we still have work to do because there are a lot of um, folks in San Antonio that one, aren't aware and two, don't have access um, to a lot of these opportunities. So we have to continue to dig deeper um, to open up areas of opportunity and drive economic mobility. Hey, Jenna, to expand on that, uh, you touched upon one, of course, uh, for Toyota, to reinvest in the community, uh, we spend about 75% of our philanthropic give uh, to workforce and education, again, through K-4, through the uh, university programs. But for Alamo Promise, we did commit a $500,000 investment as part of the uh, community. Kevin, that's fantastic. Great news to hear on that. I'm very appreciative of that. that. That is really good. Again, I would ask the audience, if there's any questions, please raise your hand or send them in the chat box. We do have another that just popped up in the in the chat box. Uh, Kevin, if you'd like to grab it, it's from Tom King. Okay, just let me see. Um, it says, the question is, how does the shift from just in time uh, sorry, how does the shift from just in time to just in case impact your uh, supply cost? The stockpiling Right. Does stockpiling against unforeseen shortages and unforeseen social problems reduce your profitability and ability to grow? So that's a great question. Uh, I think I spoke to this a little bit in my presentation. Uh, so certainly we're not abandoning our TPS Toyota principles. That's our foundation at Kaizen. But just because I've got just in time doesn't mean we don't have diversification and insulation. So just as we move uh, one of the things about when we moved here to Texas, you know, we have 24 on-site suppliers on our campus. And when we have that, it's because our supply chain needs to be closer to us to regionalize us. And we constantly look at our supply chain shifting to make sure that we have localization to protect against the long-term variability that we can't control. And part of that long-term variability may be what we call safety stock. And even in our on-site operations, there are hours of inventory instead of days or weeks or months, but there's still hours of inventory when we could just make it direct. But I think that it's in our principles of TPS about how you balance efficiency uh, because we measure downtime in minutes to a loss that could be avoided with some insulation of uh, like a safety stock or something like that. That's part of the Toyota principle. So I think it's just the nature of 
uh, taking history and, and making sure that we uh, find out a way like we're doing now, where other automakers were a little too lean of what's the right balance to make sure economics and be able stability to run. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Tom, is that, uh, <clears throat> did you have a, a follow-up question to that one? Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's, yeah, I appreciate that perspective. And then uh, also, I thought Toyota had kind of developed the concept of loyalty to a supplier. But then when you introduce the concept of, well, this supplier might be shut down by unforeseen circumstances and social disasters. Um, and then you start scoping out compet competing sur suppliers. How do you reconcile that? Because, I mean, Toyota is well known for its close partnership with its suppliers, and yet you've got to start looking at their competitors just in case this one crashes. Hey Tom, that's a that's a great question, and and when we we do call our suppliers more our partners, and not just the ones we have on campus with us, but all of our long term, we we look at their operations more of the long the long haul versus the short term. It's not solely based upon one aspect of their business or maybe competitiveness of who's the cheapest. I want to use that word purposely because that's not the way we look. We look at stable and flexible and long term competitiveness. Competitiveness is the key. So when we build with the supplier, uh, we know where we are initially, but then we teach them the principles about how they can lower their own costs so we can lower our overall cost of our vehicle to remain competitive for our customers. And, and part of that is how they operate. And when you talked about social disasters, I can't tell you how many times that uh, because of the fire or the breakdown or a tornado that maybe a Toyota sends its resources to help the supplier effectively rebuild because they are a strong partner. Uh, in the case of the floods or the Renesis fire, uh, we've sent people from Japan to help them rebuild and then again, put things in their processes to make sure they can be sustainable so that we don't interrupt the supply chain. So it goes beyond just the partnership of a financial. It is truly a teaching, a learning, and uh, sometimes a physical interaction with to make sure we can look throughout the supply chain. Well, I guess maybe I'm a nervous person, but they, uh, I, I mean, I'm into loyalty. I get it. And that it, it inspires me how you are so loyal. But at the same time, I guess you're going to, in order to really protect yourself, like in the recent crisis, um, you've got to be aware of all the other suppliers, even though you're not using them. You've got to, and I guess that's what you're saying. You'll still be loyal to the supplier, protect them, help them. But but just in case there's a total crash, you're going to be aware of what the rest of the market is. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I know that they've got to be competitive on their own also. So it doesn't mean that those suppliers can't uh, that don't operate with other business. We just make sure how we have our businesses segregated uh, that we can work clearly with them. And if they want to work with other partners, that's fine as long as we yeah. know where their boundaries are. That's that's our key. I, I know one large company here, not you, but um, they get exclusives. Like they'll say, you can't deal with competitors. You have to deal only with us. I guess you don't. You're not. You're saying you don't really do any of that. Yeah, yeah, not so much. I don't think we dictate what they can and can't do. Uh, they're an independent supplier, but we just need to how how we separate, make sure, especially confidentiality, and to protect our business. That's all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Tom, thank you for the questions. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more. I do know that Kevin has an appointment here at one o'clock, uh, but Jen and I will still be here to answer any questions if there are any. Um, Michelle, you don't see anything in the, in the box right now, do you? No, sir, I do not. Okay, good, good. Kevin, Jenna, thank you so much for the presentations that you all gave us, great information. Good to know what's going on with Toyota and what's happening with the future of Toyota and its contributions to our community. Jenna, great work at the EDF in making sure that we got a workforce for the uh, for the future. Uh, really appreciate all that you do. So how about a function F4 for everybody? And we'll do a clap.
Yes, there you go. <laughs> anyway, Kevin, Ray, thank you so much. Ray, thank you for allowing uh, uh, Toyota to participate. Jenna, thank you for uh, uh, co-speaking with me. It's a, it's a great partnership. And to all the SAMA members, uh, you know, we're one big community here and Ray's organization through SAMA is a great resource to share. Uh, he has access and uh, sometimes we do uh, some sharing of our learnings. So always willing to uh, reach out, but uh, thank you for having us. You bet, you bet. At this time we are adjourned and I would encourage everybody to go to the Expo Hall and visit all the uh, booths.